Hello and um, welcome. Uh, my name is Sanjay Sarma. Good afternoon from um, Cambridge. Um, my name, I am the Vice President for Open Learning at MIT and I'm also a Professor of uh, Mechanical Engineering. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you uh, at this event. Um, it is one of MIT's Open Learning Talks um, and um, we look forward to engaging with you both through Q&A and through the discussion of our expert panelists. A little bit of housekeeping to get going first. Um, first of all, you'll notice that there's a red dot on the red light on your uh, Zoom panels. That means we'll be recording today's uh, discussion. Just want to warn you about that. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce our panelists uh, and they'll each speak about their work for a bit. And then in the last 15 or 20 minutes, we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Um, there are a few uh, ways of asking questions. You should know this uh, if you've used Zoom uh, uh, before. Uh, the first is that um, you can simply go to the Q&A and type your question in there. And if you do that, the question will be read out for you. Uh, if you want to ask the question live, please feel free to, um, to raise your little blue hand. Um, you'll see a button for that. Um, and if you do that, we will ask you to appear on the screen and ask the question. Um, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to use the chat uh, and speak to the moderator and they'll give you uh, feedback. A uh, quick final note, this is a very international group. We would love to hear from you. So feel free to please type in uh, where you're from, which country you're from and so on, um, um, especially if, if, you're, if you're from outside the United States. So we get a sense here that of the international scale of this. So let's kick things off. Uh, this has been a very difficult year for education. Parents are teaching their children from home. Uh, most children are learning uh, virtually uh, using online platforms. Um, you know, universities are online, professors are teaching, um, adult learners are learning remotely. And all this has um, added an extra layer of, layer of chaos into people's lives. Uh, it's unprecedented and the added stress has almost certainly affected students' ability to learn effectively. Um, and we all know the research, which is that a student who's anxious or depressed or not properly motivated will not learn as effectively uh, as they might under normal circumstances. Uh, today, we have three great panelists to talk to you about uh, mindfulness uh, and, me and mental well being and how it plays a, a role in learning and educational effectiveness. Um, this open learning talk is hosted by, the, uh, by MIT's Integrated Learning Initiative, a research branch of open learning and features members of a newly created team called the Mental Wellness Initiative, which is focused on exploring uh, a series of questions about, around identifying, detecting, and acting on the cognitive and neural correlates of uh, autism, anxiety, and depression, uh, and Alzheimer's, and as uh, to see how they impact learning. So I'd like to now introduce you to the three panelists. Um, their CVs are too extensive for me to really cover in detail here. Uh, and this is in no particular order. I'll start with Professor Pavan Sinha. Uh, Pavan is a professor of vision and computational neuroscience in MIT's brain and cognitive sciences department. And um, he will be um, uh, speaking, um, I'll go to him first. Uh, second is Patty Mays. Patty is a professor in MIT's program in media arts and sciences. She runs the Media Labs Fluid Interfaces Research Group which aims to radically reinvent the um, human machine experience. And last but certainly not the least is, um, is Professor John Gabrielli, uh, the director of the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative and a professor in the MIT Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department. Um, we'll start with a quick uh, self-introduction by each of the panelists. So um, uh, let's start first, actually I'll start with Patty first. Uh, Patty, if you could tell us a little bit about your work, we'll keep this to about ten minutes. If you, if the panelists could speak, speak, speak for about three minutes or so, that'd be great. Patty, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, as you heard, my background is in artificial intelligence and human-computer interaction, and my work is all about the role that personal digital technologies of the future can play in mental well-being and learning. We all have digital devices with us all the time these days, uh, smartphones, smartwatches, fitness trackers and more, but increasingly future versions of these devices um, are able to sense and analyze our cognitive and emotional state. 
For example, there are headphones, wristbands, eyeglasses under developments that have built-in brain sensors and physiological sensors so that they can understand in the moment whether a person is anxious or calm, focused or distracted and more. And I, these wearable devices can do more than just sense and al analyze our state. They can also increasingly intervene in the moment to support us with learning and well being. For example, they can issue uh, a little reminder to stay alert and attentive when our attention is waning in a situation where it is important to remain externally focused, like when attending a lecture or they may use sound in a more subliminal way uh, to influence our breathing rhythms when we are too anxious so as to calm us down. Wearable devices are also being used uh, to provide real-time support for people with autism one of the groups uh, that we are interested in here today. For example, BrainPower is a company founded by an MIT alum, Nat Sehin, that uses augmented reality headsets to help individuals with autism learn to read facial expressions in real time. So these are just some of the examples in which I believe increasingly our personal and wearable devices will play a key role in helping everyone with mental well-being and with learning. And their interventions will be high or can be highly personalized, of course, to an individual's unique style of learning and their current state. And they will also increasingly be based on uh, the science of uh, learning and the brain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, next, John, if you would, uh, if you could introduce yourself uh, and speak to the speak to the uh, question. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Sanjay. Um, so uh, I'm John Gabriel in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, my background is in the brain basis of learning and memory in children, adolescents, and adults, and I retain that interest. I mean, learning is amazing. Uh, and uh, uh, But I've also gotten very, very interested in emotions and mental well-being. Um, we know those, those are hugely important things for those we care about. As I see people uh, putting in their names from all over the world, uh, it reminds me that we all want to have a healthy brains, uh, mental well-being, and we care so much about it for those around us, those, as teachers, as educators, as parents. And so uh, it's so important. And uh, we'll come back to this, but we're really challenged. Uh, uh, as Professor Sarma said, uh, the pandemic uh, period has really made it even more challenging than ever. But even before that, uh, in the United States, for example, approximately one in seven children uh, have a diagnosable uh, mental uh, uh, health problem, but only about half of those ever get treated is the current public health estimate. So. Uh, so I'm very interested in understanding what is the brain basis of mental well-being, what are the threats to mental well-being, and so I work on understanding what's happening in the brain of children and adolescents with these difficulties, as well as collaborating with physicians on, and psychologists on interventions. What can we do about it? Pharmacological interventions, uh, behavioral interventions, ones we can do in schools for all students, and increasingly we're all excited, as Patty suggested, uh, about how we can use technology not just as a way to have an inferior learning at home uh, in terms of, you know, for Zoom learning for uh, kindergartners, uh, but, you know, can we use it actually to reach out to all kinds of people and have, and make it, you know, mental health being a more uh, possible for many people. Uh, and it's pretty exciting, I think, we'll come back to this, uh, that, that uh, remote technology might be a huge factor in making a mental health available for many, many more children and adults. Thank you, John. Pavan? Thank you, Sanjay, for moderating today's event. Um, welcome, everyone. I've been looking at the at people's names and locations in the chat, and it's really amazing how diverse the gathering is. Um, I also want to thank Jeff, Steve, and Sucharita for bringing us all together into the initiative that Sanjay mentioned, the Mental Wellness Initiative, uh, and also my deep admiration and respect for the work that Patty and John are doing. I've long been an admirer uh, of their work. So it's a true privilege 
to be on the same panel uh, as them. So to introduce my lab's work, uh, the work that my students and I do is intimately tied to the issue of learning. How does the brain learn the regularities of the world? And how is this process affected in conditions like autism? Uh, my background is, well, used to be in computer science, uh, but then for my graduate work and uh, postdoctoral and faculty career, um, I've been in the Department of, of Neuroscience here at MIT. So in service of the first part of this question of how the brain learns the regularities of the world, we work with congenitally blind children whom we treat surgically. It's work that has both humanitarian as well as scientific relevance, since not only does it improve children's lives, it also gives us an opportunity to study how the newly sighted children learn and how the brain responds to massive sensory changes late in childhood, attesting to neural plasticity. Through an interesting chain of empirical results and inferences, this work with blind children in India has led to our lab's work in autism and an exploration of how learning processes are affected in this condition. An intriguing possibility that some of our theoretical and experimental work has suggested is that autism may be accompanied by difficulties in detecting and learning predictive relationships in the world. The real world to an autistic person may appear less predictable than to a neurotypical individual. This may result in anxiety, stress, and withdrawal. These two key constructs, neural plasticity and predictability, may have very interesting linkages with meditation and mindfulness. Therefore, the practice of mindfulness may have significant impact and bearing on learning and anxiety or mental wellness more generally. I'll stop there, Sanjay. Thank you very much, um, um, Pavan. Very exciting. By the way, we have uh, participants from every longitude and latitude, it looks like. It's wonderful. We have folks from Chile, from Hawaii, from Australia, from the UK, um, literally all, all over the world. So thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, really great. Maybe we kick it off with a question for all three panelists, but I just want to remind everyone, please feel free to post your questions and then we'll call upon you. Um, either we'll read out your question or call upon you. Um, so, so, so John, Patty, and Pavan, um, mindfulness and wellness are important in all aspects of lives, um, of, of life. Um, can you share any examples that have, um, of how they've impacted um, uh, learning specifically? So we start, start, maybe we'll mix things up here a little bit. Go with you first, Pavan. Sure. So I should mention that my uh, exposure to mindfulness has been through curiosity, and I can't profess any any expertise in this domain. So uh, we don't have any experimental data that I can refer to that we have gathered, but it's a field that uh, I've long been been curious about and have done some bit of reading on. So to Sanjay's question of how does mindfulness or how might mindfulness affect learning? Um, here's my, my thinking about it. By cutting down on distractions, mindfulness essentially reduces the unpredictability inherent in those distractions. And you will see that I keep coming back to these constructs of predictability and plasticity repeatedly. Um, with unpredictability comes the drawing away of attention to novel items. What's unpredictable is also novel, and our brains have this inherent tendency to attend to novel items. So if one is unable to predict, one finds lots of things novel, and it's, it, it's got a cost in terms of attentional allocation. Mindfulness can counteract this tendency by allowing more sustained attention to be brought to bear on an item. Practice in doing so through mindfulness can help facilitate learning since sustained attention is known to enhance information uptake and information retention. 
and if I have just 30 more seconds, I may mention that mindfulness may also have interesting connections to neural plasticity. Studies with non-human subjects have suggested that a temporary quieting of local brain activity might be able to enhance that region's plasticity and therefore the ability to learn new material. We are very interested in finding out whether meditation might have this enhancing effect on plasticity by leading to a quieting, even transient, a transient quieting of brain activity. Perfect, thanks, Pavan. Paddy? Paddy, you're muted. So yeah, um, my colleagues uh, have talked about how uh, the state of the mind is so important for being able to uh, learn and consolidate new information. Um, so my um, question that I always focus on then is how can we teach and develop mindfulness? How can we help people um, with self-knowledge and with um, sort of developing this uh, ability to calm their mind and to um, focus their mind? I think mindfulness uh, it, and, and meditation are sort of fairly hard notions to understand and, and really master. And I think we need to give people um, tools that they can use to better understand sort of using, for example, biofeedback. That's one of the main uh, techniques that we use. Um, we need to give them tools like that so they can understand more what it means to be in that state or to have that state of mind that is um, uh, more mindful and calm and maybe open to new information. Thank you, Patty. In fact, we'll come back to that in a minute because of your extraordinary work in VR and AR related to this. John, you've done a lot of work, of course, in mindfulness and default mode and, um, and mind wandering. Could you speak a little bit to the question? Sure. So um, when I first got into this field, because uh, uh, we, we lament all the difficulties that we all face and so many of us in mental health and what, what can help. So um, the first thing is we asked uh, in the most straightforward way, we, we uh, gave 2,000 uh, middle school children, grades five through eight, a very simple questionnaire about their degree of mindfulness that researchers have worked up. And then we asked, does a more mindful child do better in school? And what we found was uh, we had their grades, we had their statewide test scores, and the children who were more mindful, the more mindful they were, and this is a very diverse sample from an urban area in Boston, uh, the better their grades, the better their test, statewide test scores, and they have fewer suspensions and fewer absences. That is, they were more engaged in school and more present in the most literal sense in school. So this is sort of objective evidence that a more mindful child does better by all traditional measures of educational achievement and support. Second, can we change mindfulness in a child? So we got to work with a, a local inner city school serving primarily uh, minority and lower income families. Uh, and we got to do a randomized controlled trial, a real science experiment where half the children for eight weeks got mindfulness instruction and half got something that's close to our hearts also, computer programming instruction, also a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we found was that only the children who got the mindfulness instruction, and I'm sure the computer programming thing was great, but only the children who got the mindfulness instruction showed reduced stress, reduced negative feelings, and gained abilities to uh, focus their attention over long periods. And we measured these things in very objective ways. And lastly, I'll say that we saw in these same children corresponding brain plasticity, uh, as, as Pavan Sinha mentioned. We saw changes in the neural system uh, that's associated with stress and negative feelings involving the amygdala. And we saw changes in uh, dorsal, the connectivity, the functional connectivity of dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the frontal part of the brain that's associated with thinking, problem solving, and so on. So we saw a corresponding change in behavior. Uh, a corresponding uh, improvement in, in feelings and uh, the brain changes that were associated with these gains. And so this, these, this research studies uh, that we've all published have made me very enthusiastic about uh, mindfulness that can be taught, can change the brain, and can enhance outcomes uh, both for how children feel about themselves and how well they do in school. Thank you very much, John. One question from Ranjan Ganguly. He says, and maybe you can do this uh, 
sort of in a sentence each, which is probably impossible, but try mindfulness and plasticity, how would you define them or describe them? John, I'm going to put it to you as the uh, sure. as a cognitive. Uh, so as a cognitive plasticity medicine. is easy for us. It's, it's changes in the brain uh, with experience. And so we can measure structural and functional changes. That's all we mean is, can we measure something that changes in the brain? So all of learning depends on plasticity. If you learn something, your brain has changed. Uh, if you feel better than you used to, your brain has changed. Your mind is what the brain does. And so, but we, we can measure those brain changes using neural imaging techniques. So that's, that's what we mean by plasticity, change in brain structure or function uh, due to experience. Um, in terms of mindfulness, we can have much longer uh, definitions and I mean, my colleagues will have better ones, but in one sentence, it's the ability, uh, especially early on in mindfulness of training to be, to pay attention to the present moment, to be, you know, in the moment, uh, your mind not wandering away to uh, fears about the future, concerns about the past, but be aware of the moment and yourself in that moment. Although as people become very experienced, uh, it becomes a richer uh, mental capacity. Terrific. Well, thank, thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, being in the moment, being still and so on, I think uh, um, uh, something we're learning more about. I I'm going to go to a question. Um, I have a few questions coming up and some other questions that um, um, come from combining uh, some of the thoughts here. Maybe I'll go to you, Pawan, um, and ask, um, you touched on reducing anxiety and stress as a means of helping students focus. Um, what are some of the things students can do at home to help with this, do you think? That's a great question, Sanjay. Um, and uh, especially in, in the COVID times, that is a very germane question. Um, so control or having some sense of how things are going to unfold is very calming. Uh, reduced predictability is on the other hand, anxiogenic. It induces stress, perhaps because it indicates a lack of control. So in the extreme case, as I'm sure many uh, many in the group know, uh, reduced predictability may lead to learned helplessness with extreme amounts of stress and anxiety. So one way to reduce anxiety and stress is to increase the structure in your day, in your environment. Give yourself that scaffolding that you can adhere to. Um, routines and schedules can be very calming. Um, and this also connects to our thinking about autism. A reduction in endogenous predictive skills may be the source of the commonly observed uh, anxiety uh, that one finds in individuals with, with autism. Bringing in, in routine, bringing in some structure, not to the extent of completely uh, uh, getting rid of, of uh, unstructured time and be, time to be creative, but having some structure in the day, I think can be very beneficial for reducing anxiety and stress. Perfect, thanks. Um, uh, is there a way, Patty, coming to you, can you talk a little bit about uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and instrumentation and its impact? Uh, structure is one way. Is there other sort of um, measurement tools to encourage it? Yeah, so I think techn technology can help in multiple ways. Um, First, uh, technology can help us understand ourselves better through biofeedback. For example, we can learn to recognize our mental state better and learn to calm, to recognize it that it's, uh, that maybe we're too anxious right now and should calm ourselves down. Um, in one study, for example, we made it easier for people to be aware of their own heartbeat. very simple. And we taught them that just by breathing, we showed them that just by breathing more slowly and deeply, that they could uh, bring their heart, their heartbeat or heart rate, I should say, down and calm themselves down. So I think we can teach them certain skills that they can use in the moment. Um, and later, the technology actually is no longer needed. People can actually internalize what they have learned by first having the technology assist them and uh, teach them something that then they can uh, use without the technology being present. Um, 
I think that technology can, al can also help us develop certain skills or habits. Um, and it can do so by intervening in the moment, for example, to remind us to be, to remain focused, say, when we're attending a lecture like this. But again, the hope is that over time, if you develop, if it becomes more of a habit, that then you can internalize that skill and you don't, you no longer need the technology. Basically, the technology is only a type of scaffolding um, to teach a, a person to be able to sustain their attention for longer. Uh, this is actually one of the experiments that uh, we're doing with um, a pair of glasses that has built-in EEG, so brainwave um, reading um, ability, and EOG, or uh, eye movement uh, reading. Uh, based on those two uh, sensors, we can actually determine whether a person is externally focused or attentive, and uh, um, we can actually remind people um, in a simple way to remain externally focused if we want to help them sustain uh, their attention for longer. Perfect, thanks. You know, I should tell you that uh, a few years ago, my wife got me one of those Muse headsets. Yeah. You know? And of course, rather than using it to learn to meditate, I dissected it to figure out how the EEG worked. So, and I couldn't put it back together, which is a whole other story. There's a question here from um, Kyle Keen, our own Kyle Keel from MIT, which I think I'll point to you, John. It says there's an important difference between concentration and mindfulness. And uh, can you clarify that difference? How would you say, you know, what, what, how do they play, play, play out? Uh, I think um, mindfulness is, is a much um, a broader uh, capacity. Uh, it, it, it allows uh, concentration. In fact, what we showed, the, the experiment we did with the, the, with the uh, sixth graders was we had them do quite a boring task and saw if they if they started to lose attention now it's a you know you want sometimes people worry all of education is a bit like that but uh, uh you know and what we just found is that you know with uh, the mindfulness training the concentration was improved uh, that they could focus in on a task longer even when it, when it was not inherently uh, engaging or rewarding uh, and so um so that is a, a benefit but we you know we th just think of it as one small expression of mindfulness that it's uh, it has many expressions including uh, people feeling less stressed than they did, uh, fewer negative emotions. And so it's more fundamental um, and covers a, a much broader uh, sort of part of, of being a person. Uh, so the, the focus concentration is one of the, of the benefits though. And maybe while we have you on the screen, I'll ask you this question. Uh, there's some general sort of uh, a discussion around how, uh, is it, can you be specific about mindfulness? What does it really mean? And so I was wondering if perhaps you could speak to the, uh, you know, the imaging sort of consequences, you know, where can you tell from an image from fMRI that someone is um, in, in, in a state of mindfulness? Uh, you know, not terrifically. And I hate to say that because my wife is doing brain imaging. So, uh, you know, we, but, so we have these uh, correlational um, measures on average and people, for example, have shown brain differences actually for people who've done many years of mindfulness meditation. So they're really experts, they're not just eight weeks. Uh, they've shown uh, compared to non-meditators functional and structural brain differences. Uh, we can't, our measurements are not good enough that we can put one pre person in the scanner and say, ah, oh, you're mindful or you're not. Maybe that's a good thing that we can't do that. Um, but on average, we can take averages across groups of people and, and we do see differences and there's a pretty substantial literature in that. Great. Pawan, there's a question here that really falls perfectly in everything you've said, but also your extraordinary work with Project Prakash. Um, our meditation practices, this from Nancy, our meditation practices and various mindfulness practices being utilized with newly sighted children? So, not yet, but as soon as the COVID restrictions are lifted, they will in the following way. Um, so the children who have gained sight after many years of, of blindness, they, they continue to have some visual impairments. I mean, their vision is not completely normal right after surgery. Interestingly enough, when we are born, well, every newborn baby has impairments that are even worse than the impairments that the Project Prakash children, that's the name of the project in, in India, that the Project Prakash children exhibit right after sight surgery. For some reason, 
a newborn baby is able to overcome those visual impairments over the first several months or a few years, whereas the Prakash children seem to be stuck with some of those impairments. The culprit likely is reduced plasticity of the brain uh, at a later time point in the developmental timeline. And the question for us is, is there some way in which we can intervene uh, to enhance the neural plasticity for the Prakash children so that their post-operative outcomes can be even better than what they are at the moment? And for that purpose, this is a huge question. I mean, if we succeed on this, it'll be a very big deal to actually change uh, brain plasticity uh, late in childhood. So one of the avenues that we are exploring for, for enhancing brain plasticity is meditation. Uh, and we want to see whether even a short duration of meditation uh, can be effective on a fairly well-defined metric of, of brain plasticity and changing the post-operative outcomes of these children. So stay tuned, it'll be a really exciting outcome. No, that's fantastic. You know, um, I have a question for you, Patty. Um, we have uh, rumors of Apple producing its new uh, AR VR glasses. You have the HoloLens. I can imagine a day in which a day when we all wear these glasses and we go around, uh, go about our daily businesses with you know whatever we do with our you know our wearables and all that. I wonder, can you imagine a day when while we're doing our normal work, the system is also monitoring us and saying, listen. Do this little exercise. You need to do it right now. It's good for you. Right? Do you do you see that? What, what's your vision there? Yes, um, I I envision that uh, the wearables in the future, uh, wearables of the future, will be able to maybe help us in uh, put us in the right state or frame of mind for the activity um, that we want to engage in next. For example, um, it has been shown that if you um, uh, see some jokes or laugh first, that then right after you're better at um, creative tasks and divergent thinking. So devices going forward may put a, um, like alter our environment, maybe through music, through things that they say to us, etc., so that we are put in the right state and can, for example, in one moment be more creative and think more broadly and in a more divergent way. And in other moments, maybe be very focused and less um, creative in a way uh, in our thinking. So I think that's uh, in the longer term future um, that uh, this uh, will be possible. I even see think that going um, further that basically our digital devices will act as personal mentors that um, teach us in the moment, not just how to be mindful or control our emotions or put us in a certain mental state, but also just teaching us new skills and new knowledge in the moment based on what it is that we're trying to do and what it is that we're interested in. So. Um, maybe from today's Siri will ultimately go to sort of a personal Play-Doh <laughs> in our devices that knows us very well and can engage us and can help us in the moment with whatever uh, tasks that we're dealing with. Now, you know, I have to say the Siri has been driving me crazy recently, so it'll have to do a lot better than it's been doing. Sarah Alvanipur has a question uh, that I think uh, I can ask you, uh, John, which is, how can we employ mindfulness in those with mental disorders such as high anxiety, OCD, ADHD, and who have trouble focusing any research with the vagus nerve? Yeah, the, the great question and super interesting. Um, in, in many ways, um, uh, of course, if a person has a mental health challenge that makes them hard for them to you know, be engaged in sort of a dialogue or something like that, that, that will be a, a difficulty. And often, you know, there's more than one treatment is needed up for, depending on the severity. But um, in many ways, uh, there, there's some similarity in broad terms between mindfulness and what people talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Which is as effective as any medication and which is very much focused on the now uh, uh, in contrast to Freudian psychoanalysis, you know, we try to figure out what happened to you as a kid. Uh, um, and uh, so th there's a lot of similarity really philosophically 
It's just that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a very big engagement. And, and that's, and might not, you know, and, and whereas uh, the amazing thing about mindfulness is there's so much encouraging evidence that things like apps can reach so many people uh, in, in so many remote locations are very effective. So uh, uh, I do think that for many people facing mental health challenges or facing um, challenges because they're in perhaps growing up in chaotic or under supported environments, I mean, I think the evidence is pretty good. Um, uh, you know, one of the challenges uh, is that um, sometimes people want to know like which mindfulness thing, and I, I, I do think we need to understand which ones really work because a critique of the field has been like almost everything can be called mindfulness, <laughs> and you know uh, I, I think with this one of the goals of research is to identify the specific apps or the specific constructs that really help people, and maybe that will differ a little bit depending on a person's challenge. Maybe depression will be different than anxiety in terms of an optimal program, and we just need to do the science to know that. But in terms of general promise. Uh, and to be highly scalable and technologically supported in the way that uh, Patty has talked about. Um, I think it's hard to think of something more promising really than mindfulness at the moment. Um, oh, while we have you here, Eva Katsulakis um, asks about, um, uh, wouldn't ch mindful children come from higher, a higher socioeconomic status? In other words, wouldn't that confound the, the, um, the solution? And then there's a, a related question um, on, um, um, dyslexia, and this is from someone who has the name of Lenovo laptop, which I'm assuming is the name of their computer. Um, but dyslexia and socioeconomic status, John. Yeah, so two, two things about that. Um, it is true that you, when you give these surveys of mindfulness, children who come from more supported environments uh, 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 score higher. I mean, it's, it is helpful to have more support, better nutrition, better health care, better educational systems working for you, that's for sure. But in our study with uh, children from, from, again, from a lower uh, SES environment, lower income family, um, the benefits of mindfulness in terms of everything we've measured have been equal across all strata. So if you come from a household that has lower income and, and lower educational support, still more mindfulness gains that child as much as more mindfulness gains a child coming from a, a more well-off environment. So it's beneficial at all levels and as far as we can measure equally so. Um, so that, uh, and then the, so, so I, I, you know, it's, it's really, it could be a really great thing to help so many more children who are at high risk in terms of the environments they're in, uh, the risk for flourishing. There's a question here, which maybe Pavan, it's, it's about EDMR, uh, which is eye movement. Uh, I'm looking it up on the internet as we speak, desensitization and, and reprocessing EDMR. Um, have uh, Patty, uh, you or Pavan followed EDMR therapy? And the question is, is it uh, useful to consider for anxiety? I have not. Uh, Patty, I'll let you. No, I, I, I mean, we're just actually very recently started, uh, we've started looking at it and we're just curious whether maybe some of this could be delivered once again through devices as opposed to uh, or that would be developed, of course, with the help from experts, but uh, just to make um, some of these techniques uh, more widely accessible and also be able to um, evaluate them more um, in natural settings, not just in the uh, therapist's office. Interesting. You know, uh, Patty, as I hear you describe this, I mean, one of the things one could do is um, uh, there's a question actually on on past traumas. I think mindfulness can also help with uh, no regressing to past traumas. Uh, mm -hmm. Both Pavan and Patty, I just wondered, you know, if you had to sort of construct a system to do that, and Patty, you from an instrumentation and response perspective, and Pavan, you from a more fundamental perspective, how do you address past traumas? What would you say? We'll start with you, Patty. Yeah, so again, this is um, very much ongoing work, but uh, we have been reading about this a little bit. And um, basically, uh, right now, these uh, sessions happen um, in a therapist's office where the therapist um, instructs you to uh, use certain eye movements while thinking of particular um, first negative thoughts, um, maybe related to some trauma, um, and then positive rephrasings of uh, those same um, uh, uh, thoughts. So again, we're just starting with thinking about how um, wearable devices um, could basically deliver some of this same technique 
um, in the home so that people could use it, possibly with sending some of the data of sessions and so on off to the therapist, but so that you can um, basically in a, a more frequent, uh, um, uh, with more frequency engage in these types of sessions because you can use it in a home setting. Yes, Sanjay, in terms of trauma, of the, of the very few uh, cautions that I have seen mentioned associated with mindfulness, uh, trauma is, or past trauma, is one of the, the, the cautionary notes that are sounded. And in reading the literature on how mindfulness might actually uh, interact negatively with, with past trauma, I get the I get the sense that there are cases where mindfulness, instead of helping, might actually uh, worsen the the condition. But what I don't get from the literature is how can one tell when mindfulness is going to be beneficial versus not recommended. Um, so I know that there is this this cautionary note in the in the literature. Thank you. That's a, that's a good thing to point out, Pavan, because I've also read about it. I haven't actually seen the, I haven't, I'm not an expert enough to really sort of think uh, through all the consequences, but that's a good caution. Patty, I think you referred to at some point research on uh, heart rate and breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, there was a question about, is that available somewhere publicly? And I, I'm not sure you can, this is from Kavita. I'm not sure you can immediately recall the reference, but. Yes. I can put it in the chat if people want, um, or do, do the, does the audience see the chat? I'm not sure. It's the work. Yeah, you can put it to all panelists. If you put it on all panelists, and panelists and also oh, yeah. all participants, they can see it. Yes, yeah. Sanjay, uh, there's one question that I've been dying to ask please. of John and Patty. Please, please. Um, so as uh, fellow academicians, we, you would agree that mindfulness as an in intervention is one of the most most powerful, most effective uh, and demonstrably effective interventions that we have for various uh, conditions and even for general mental health. So given that we have such an effective tool, why do you think it's not more widely deployed and why is there in our own community, in the community of scientists, there's not more of a vigorous push to mm -hmm. demonstrating its, its effectiveness? Mm -hmm. Why are researchers who work on mindfulness still a fairly small, a handful of, of researchers? Mm -hmm. I'll let John answer that question since his work is closest. Well, um... Yeah, I, 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 so, so it's true. I think partly uh, some claims about mindfulness, Pavanas, you know, uh, that he have been overblown or a little bit loose. And so uh, it's been, I think, in the public mind and perhaps even in the mind of scientists, it's been like some new age things where there's, you know, aspirations and hope. Uh, and I think, and that sometimes I think blocked people from actually looking at, just as you described very eloquently, the actual research is very compelling. Um, uh, it, it's not an easy thing, as you know. It has to be worked on a little, a little bit like physical exercise. So you know, it's not, it's not a solution that where you can just uh, do a couple of things like to pop a pill, so to speak, and be mindful. Um, you know, it does require some engagement and work on behalf of the person as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing um, I understand too that in the United States and different countries have different uh, uh, challenges. Uh, Sometimes it's gotten mixed into, actually, I've heard from uh, school providers of mindfulness programs, even mixed in with religious issues that doesn't reflect one religion compared to another religion. And so, so uh, its roots, uh, you know, are sometimes confuse people as well. And so, I, I, you know, some of these things are just, um, I, I think, um, hmm. kind of silly or, or, or reflect different forms of, of lack of knowledge. Uh, but I agree with you that um, if there were a medicine with as much evidence of its uh, help for people as this, you know, it'd be flying off the shelves of every pharmacy. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I agree that somehow the message is not out to the public and even among scientists uh, because of sort of a priori suspicions and skepticisms that are misplaced. Hmm. Adi? 
Yeah, um, I think that um, there's also problems with um, deploying some of these uh, techniques. And, and uh, for example, if you look at uh, the concept of the growth mindset, um, that um, there's there have been a lot of problems with um, rolling out sort of or scaling up the technique um, uh, to um, uh, via teachers basically where often the teachers don't convey these um, these notions and skills and so on in the best possible way. So um, I think that that is another uh, problem actually ultimately. From, from sort of science <laughs> to practice, uh, there's a, a huge gap, yeah, especially practice at scale. Great, thanks. Um, I, there was a question from um, Claudia Urea. Cla Claudia, do you wanna come on screen and ask, ask the question? We're gonna, we'll try and do the screen thing now. Hmm. Can we promote Claudia to, uh, Claudia's from MIT. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, I mean, I had a question about um, the level of mindfulness and how to measure that. And, and my question comes, um, you know, as we we found out about this project in China that was trying to um, read brain waves of kids and parents ended up rejecting. So how do we avoid something like, you know, if we have levels of mindfulness and we think about, you know, machines that read those, how do we avoid the same uh, kind of uh, catastrophe that happened in China? So mm -hmm. that's my question. Yeah, well, I guess that's a question for me. <laughs> I think that the uh, ethical issues surrounding all of this are huge, um, of course, and we think about this a lot in my group, how we can still um, deploy ultimately these types of technologies without um, sort of um, uh, running into all these uh, ethical problems. And um, I think very important is that um, people need to ultimately have the choice to use these um, technologies or not use them. And even in the moment have the choice to use them or not. And it's extremely important that the data uh, belongs to them. So in many of the systems that we built, we try to build them in ways where all the processing can happen locally. Um, for example, the pair of glasses that we built that tells you when your attention is waning, we can run that completely uh, without any kind of network connection so that the person is the only one that receives the feedback and nobody else can pick up this data or um, uh, use the data in any way. It's totally a self-standing uh, 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 type of system. So. Um, and it's a system that people can use when they want to use it. I think the problem with the device in China was that they were forcing entire classrooms to use uh, this uh, band that basically would show, uh, that showed with a red, green and yellow light, uh, how attentive you were every moment of the day. And uh, I actually got to use the system and it was embarrassing because I wasn't attentive the whole time either when the person was talking about it. So I can say firsthand that I would never want to um, uh, push for such a technology to be adopted uh, because of its complete lack of privacy. And, and it was also just not accurate enough, to be honest. Thank you, Patty. I mean, I, I feel like, um when we talk about this, um, you know, techniques being used, and I'm glad you mentioned before the teachers, um, just because my daughter has experienced some of this mindfulness and is completely obscure to the kids, mm -hmm. like it's not a fact, they don't know why they're doing it, but they don't know the effect. So I think if you if you're the one to benefit, and you understand, and you, you know, you get that data is a different mm -hmm. set of uh, experience. So thank you. Can I, can I just add a note to that? I apologize, sorry. Which is, uh, I, I think, Claudia, uh, the, having a developmentally appropriate program is really important, uh, 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 you know, and uh, so there, I've worked with some providers for schools who work a lot to develop a vocabulary and instruction that's appropriate for a third grader or a fifth grader. And I agree with uh, Claudia, you know, that, uh, you know, the kind of thing that's probably, the, that kind of program would probably be insulting for an adult. Right? Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it has to be age appropriate and, and uh, so there's not going to be one program that works for everybody. Uh, and so I think that's really important to, again, to do the research 
uh, with, with the people who create the programs to make it um, age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, thanks, Claudia. So I'm I'm going to ask you to promote um, uh, Marianne Casey to the um, to the chat to the uh, video here, Jenny. I think she had a question. Maybe best she asked herself. Marianne, you had a question um, about a relative. Go ahead, please. There I'm sorry. Go. Which one? I asked a lot of questions. Which question? Were you had a question. I think about your son. Um, so. Oh, he um, he has a nonverbal learning disability. And which is very similar to autism in some ways with the executive function difficulties. Um, and I'm wondering, um, the problem with him is that he gets very emotional and stuck when it comes to him having to um, express himself or answer in class or, or even to look at people and read their emotions. And I'm wondering if there's you know, the, what kind of intervention there could be at that moment when he has this, he loses all sense of his ability to address what's in front of him and it, it falls apart for him. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, what some of these interventions, Professor Mice or Gabriella he is, you know, we need something at that moment when their emotions fail them because they're not neurotypical. They're mm -hmm. struggling with this and it's constantly in their head and at the forefront are these issues of stress and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, lack of focus and, it's just something that no matter how we, much we try to teach him, he, he falls apart in the moment with the emotions. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about interventions for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Pavan, John, Patty, anyone? Yeah, well, I don't think that any technologies are available today uh, that um, you could uh, start using, but there's definitely work in the research community, for example, on uh, using uh, VR environments for training um, uh, skills for coping uh, with situations like that. So I think that that is a potential very interesting avenue to uh, um, in virtual reality. I mean, it has the advantage that it feels very real. You're totally embodied in a, a real situation. And so you can um, help people with certain uh, anxieties and, and um, uh, that they may have without the situation itself being a potentially high cost situation. <laughs> so it still yeah. gives you the same anxiety, but if you screw up, it's not a big deal. So, um, so it's a great environment, I think, for gradually sort of training um, people to cope um, and manage their anxieties in the moment. Thank you. Thank you. I would I would think that even though in the moment when your son is having this uh, this challenge, one really wants to to do something right in that moment. What might be more effective is to prepare the groundwork so that the the incidence of these moments keeps progressively decreasing. Um, I would think that there would be a greater chance of success with that rather than trying to, to address that acute manifestation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Pavan. Um, John had a question. This is John ab uh, about um, his son's ADHD. John, if you could give us your contact, if you have something we can send it to you, probably difficult to address right now. Maybe let's close out with a, with a philosophical question I'm gonna ask all three panelists. Uh, by the way, uh, this is uh, one of a series of open learning talks and there's a link um, openlearning.mit.edu slash openlearningtalks uh, with hyphens in between um, where you can see future talks. But John, Pavan, and Patty, one of the, you know, this, we were talking about wellness. Mindfulness came up a lot. We talked about the fact that um, it also comes from different traditions. A lot of it is religious. There's sort of, what does it mean? What's the practice? But yet it is so central. And as John said, if it were if it were on the farm in a pharmacy, uh, it would be flying off the shelves. Um, so, can you sort of tease it apart? What is mindfulness at its essence, in a scientific at a scientific level, unpacked from all its origins? Maybe I'll start with um, I don't know, uh, Pavan. <laughs> don't do that, Sanjay. <laughs> uh, so, it's a question that I have also tried to to get an answer to, a clear answer to. I mean, as scientists, we want to have crisp definitions, uh, that's the starting point. 
And my definition might not be the right one, but it's the one that I'm entertaining. Uh, so my definition is of, of mindfulness is trying to, to distance oneself from uh, distractions and focusing on one item, a very simple item uh, that essentially builds your ability to maintain that focus. Uh, and the nature of that item can be anything as, uh, as has so often been mentioned. I typically just uh, focus on my breath. Uh, that's the standard recommendation. But my definition of mindfulness is distancing oneself from everything other than one item that you're focusing on. John, Patty. Yeah, well, John um, will, I think, have the most uh, scientific <laughs> explanation. But uh, for me, what it means is um, being more aware of your own mind and being able to control your mind's focus better and, and be less of a victim of sort of your emotions um, and your mind sort of pulling you um, in a, uh, directions where you may not want to go. So being, being, I think we, we all sort of feel like we have control over our bodies, but we have to learn um, and develop skills to control our mind a little bit more and our emotions. John? Yeah, I think those answers were profound. I'll just say that that ability to uh, be in the present, to choose what you pay attention to uh, in yourself or, or uh, is more challenged than ever and more valuable than ever. So, you know, the, uh, the, uh, depression in adolescence is up 33% um, in the United States in the last decade. Emergency room visits for suicide attempts or ideation is up 100% in the last decade. People are speculating about why is this? This is all before COVID. Uh, you know, what's going on in the world that we live in? Um, and one can guess a lot. Uh, some people are really keen on showing us the iPhone. I don't know. Uh, you know, these are all speculations. We'll never know it scientifically, but we do know we want to give people a kind of uh, armor in themselves to protect themselves, to uh, not be drawn into the, these kinds of things that are challenges for mental well-being, uh, and let them focus on what matters to them, uh, what's important to them, what, what's uh, uh, meaningful to them and purposeful for them. And, and I think uh, mindfulness gives you that tool, that capacity, that resilience uh, to, to uh, focus on what matters to you instead of being drawn in to the uh, hurly-burly of the world that's often uh, concerning and sometimes depressing. So there you have it, uh, three of the most hardcore scientists I know, uh, mm -hmm. extraordinary co colleagues, uh, talking about something that we're only now wrapping our hands around. And for me personally, what it means is trying to become a witness as opposed to a participant in one's thoughts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been riveted by this. I've been completely in one place. So thank you for your extraordinary thoughts, your profundity. I want to particularly thank uh, Jeff, um, Rita, and Steve. Thank you. And Janine and Barry, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And stay safe. Take care. <laughs>